Hello, good evening. It's Mover, it's Monday, and I've got a special guest, Mace Curran, uh, Thunderbird pilot, F-16 pilot, best jet ever. Uh, great career, great story. She's got an awesome venture that she's doing now that we will talk about with Upside Down Dreams and a lot of cool stuff. I've talked to her. If you guys follow me on Facebook, you saw that I shared one of her posts about Top Gun Maverick, and that's actually how this all got started because we have that in common. But without further ado, Mace, welcome. Hold on. That doesn't look right. That looks right. Hello. Hey. How are you? Good. I'm excited for this, and it is funny how it came to fruition. Yeah, yeah. We'll we'll get into the Top Gun Maverick stuff before before uh, too long. But really, this is about your story because I think everybody wants to know how you go from small town girl to Thunderbird lead solo, which is amazing. Um, let's get right into it. How'd you become a fighter pilot? Did did you have an interest when you were a kid, or was somebody in your family flying, or, or how'd you get started? I think people always expect me to talk about seeing the Thunderbirds fly as a little girl, but I have a much less uh, glamorous story of kind of just stumbling <laughs> into it. I grew up in Medford, Wisconsin, which is north central, about 4,000 people. It's pretty small. No military bases nearby. So no exposure to that. Um, I didn't have any living family that was in the military and no really aviation exposure either. I was just, I was a good student and come halfway through high school. My parents were super hardworking, but did not have a college fund for me. And they were like, hey, you've got these good grades. You should probably apply for some scholarships. And my dad brought <laughs> up ROTC. And my first reaction was, I don't want to do that. That sounds terrible. Which <laughs> I, you know, I wish I had this great story of wanting to be part of you know something bigger than myself and serve my country. That came later. Um, but as a 16-year-old, I wanted to be a regular college student, do regular college student things, live in the dorms, go to parties, all that stuff you imagine. That's kind of true, but sort of not true. <laughs> um, and then I looked into the, so my dad, you know, talked me into at least looking into it. And he was like, you know, you're really adventurous and thrill seeking. I think you'd like aviation. And I've heard that quality of life in the Air Force is where it's at. So let's at least go talk sure. to Air Force ROTC. And I, you know, wanted to get out of my small town. I wanted to travel the world. I wanted something challenging. And it kind of just rose to the top. And I applied for a scholarship and got one. And I went off to college, but as a criminal justice major with the plans oh, to go cool. OSI. Yeah, yeah, I did not go into it. Yeah gonna be the police that's actually pretty cool i, I that either way would have worked out great yeah uh i saw unfortunately it was an f-15 but i saw two f-15s taking off at tyndall halfway through college when we were on a base visit there at dusk and full ab and oh, yeah. i was like uh forget the osi thing i'm already on my way all i have to do is raise my hand and put my name in the hat for a pilot <laughs> spot might as well try um uh, here we that are hurt. <laughs> Yeah. Wow. So uh, went to real college. That's always good to hear. Not that there's anything wrong with the academy, but it's always nice to hear a ROTC success yeah. story. Was it pretty competitive? I mean, how is it like, because I know you don't commit to your, your junior year. I mean, was it was it tough or was it pretty much, uh, you know, they a lot of availability at the time? There was quite a bit of availability for pilot slots just based on my class and what people wanted to do. I think we had like six or seven spots open. And that was about the same amount of people that wanted it. Um, so that wasn't too bad. Uh, getting a fighter aircraft out of UPT though, was a whole nother story. That was much more difficult. Yeah. Yeah. So from there, uh, we're, I guess we're talking IFS from there. Is that, that kind of the, the next, next path for you? Where'd you end up going? Yeah. I had about a six month gap after I graduated, um, where I worked for, cash and got paid daily don't tell the irs uh to pick apples at an orchard <laughs> and work in a haunted house it was like the most chill oh, cool. fun six months before i went off to the rigors of pilot training um but yeah i went to ifs at pueblo colorado um which i went in with zero civilian time no ga exposure and so that was a that was a tough program honestly looking back at all the formal training programs i've been through ifs might have been the most difficult one for me personally just because I came in with no foundation. So I had to learn everything from scratch. 
did people so uh this I'm, I'm dating myself now because back in my day uh that wasn't really a, a thing but so did this just just for people that have no aviation experience or were there people that had you know pilot's licenses and stuff with you in the class that maybe could help you out yeah, I think now if you have your private pilot's license, you don't have to go through IFS. I think that was a change that they did. But when I went through, everyone had to do it. And so the people that had quite a few hours, they were, I mean, they were pretty much critical to me making it through the course. It was, I relied on other people a lot to study and ask questions and figure things out. Yeah. What did they, is it stand up? But like it's, it's structured a lot like UPT, yeah. right? Yes, you get to experience stand up for the first time and you don't, yeah, you have no idea, like at least in UPT, you have, I feel like a little bit of an idea of at least the structure of it. I yeah. feel like at IFS, we didn't even get a brief beforehand. They were just like, <laughs> stand up, stand at attention. All right, you have a generator failure. What are you going to do? And I'm like, I, I didn't even know there was an in-flight guide. I had never seen the checklist. Like, I was like, there's a generator? <laughs> like yeah. that, that's my level of knowledge at that point. Well, so, I mean, with no flying experience, were you kind of nervous about, you know, your first time flying? What was it like, you know, first time having never flown before? It was so by the time I got to solo, I was just really excited. The first few flights I was excited, but that was trumped by just the stress of the amount of things I was trying to keep track of and learn. Yeah. And so there was a lot of not having perspective on how exciting and cool it was because you're just task saturated. Yeah. I saw you posted, uh, on your Instagram the other day, your, your, uh, first, was that your solo? Was that, was that, uh, the solo picture? Yeah. The DA 20. It's that thing. Ooh, I feel like I would be scared to fly that now. It's, that would be quite different. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, cool. So after that, uh, where'd you go to, or did you have another break or did you go straight to pilot training? Straight to pilot training. I had already moved to Columbus, Mississippi, which is where I did uh, UPT. Um, then I did like a short little trip over to Colorado to do IFS, then back to Columbus to start the actual formal part of pilot training. So T6s, right? You're, you're yes. definitely yes. flying T6s. What do you think? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, uh, what did, what did you think about the, uh, sorry, I don't, that, is, that didn't mean to imply you're old, but the, uh, the T six coming from the the uh, IFS. I mean, was that a was that a big change as far as flying? I loved the T six. I think I had gotten my feet under myself just enough with like basics of aviation that my good study habits that I had kind of built throughout my childhood really paid off while we were in T sixes. And I look back on that time frame as really fun. I remember just being yeah. so excited for my dollar ride and the solos were so much fun. And I'm sure I had struggles here and there, but I was, the stoke level was high for all of T6s for me, which was a cool place to be. Did anybody in the class like have trouble with motion sickness and stuff that, or any oh, yeah. kind of adaptation problems going in? Oh yeah. Uh, luckily I've never thrown up in the jet. Um, the only time I've gotten passively motion sick was in the back seat of the F-16 teaching the new Thunderbird solo solo maneuvers. We can talk about that when we get to that part. But yeah, for sure. I never had any motion sickness issues. But there were so many people in the class that did, and they would spin them in the barony chair where, you know, you spin really fast. You, like, put yeah. your head down and then stand up, or and your eyes are, like, it. it's just overloading your body until you can uh, – you get – rid of the motion sickness, I guess, because you're so exposed to it. But I felt really bad for them. And there was one of the top guys in our class was sick almost the entire program. And really? <laughs> he would he would throw up in the middle of a check ride and then he would like crush the flight. It was incredible. <laughs> I, I don't know how he did that. <laughs> That's, that sounds like my buddy Wombat. He did the the same thing. But so active duty, I mean were you wanting fighters the whole time or like, how was the, the, the competition to track to T-38s? I was pretty much from the time partway through ROTC when I made the pivot from OSI to wanting a pilot slot, I was a fighters or bust mentality, um, which could have been a huge disappointment if that had not worked out. Um, there were definitely people that wanted T-38s that didn't get them. Uh, once we got to UPT or to the halfway point where you select into the two 
uh, tracks. I think seven of us went into T38s. Um, and I was fairly confident I would be able to make that jump. The real stress point came when it was assignment night and debating, you know, being a FAPE and what fighters were going to be available and what, if I can't get a fighter, what do I want after that? And that was stressful. Yeah. Well, how'd you like the T38? I mean, at, at T6 to T38, those are vastly different and generally yeah. generationally different aircraft. I mean, they do not fly <laughs> anything like each other. No, the T38 was more difficult to fly for sure. Less forgiving for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was fun to be in a jet. Uh, if I had to pick one to go back to fly now, though, I'd go fly the T6 because if I had endless money, I would buy a T6. They're just such cool. <laughs> <laughs> Soon. Um, We're not far. Eventually. We'll put it on the bucket list. Right. Let's 10 year goal. Um, the T38 is cool, but it definitely is aging and yeah, yeah. it's unforgiving. I mean, you can mess that yeah. thing up, especially in the landing phase, um, pretty easily. Yeah. What was the, the toughest part about the T38? Uh, you know, I mean, the pat but tr transition contact, or was it once you got to because at least when I went through T38 is kind of where they started doing more low levels, more formation, they actually expect you to be in position finally, you know, I mean, so was that more challenging kind of getting to the fighter mentality? So I think the pilot training portion of the T38, I don't remember <clears throat> any specific part being especially difficult. Of course, it was stressful the entire time you're having to put in a ton of work going on to IFF after yeah. i remember that was like a slap in the face of all of a sudden this is a lot harder than i thought it was and all the ips are super mean so i was like what is this like this is quite the, <laughs> it's the cultural shift from pilot training i was like what did i just sign myself up for yeah well so i mean how'd you pick the f-16 i mean you did get the f-16 right so how'd you pick yeah. you know of all the list you had you had seen an eagle so how did you go from seeing eagles taken off to i'm gonna fly the world's greatest aircraft so I went back and forth of for what to put at the top of my dream sheet between the Viper, the F-16 and the A-10, because I really liked the mission of the A-10 as well. Um, and when it came down to the end of the day and I had to actually put it on paper, I thought back to seeing those afterburners at mm. dusk. And that was the deciding factor. And I <laughs> liked that because the mission that I liked, you know, close air support that the A-10 did. I wanted to still be able to do that. So a multi-role fighter that can really do everything was really appealing to me. And I liked the idea of being single seat and the jet being small, like an extension of yourself, which yeah. later on when I was going cross country and trying to go to the bathroom, you know, on a five hour flight, I regretted that decision of a small cockpit, we, but it does have its perks. <laughs> that, that is its own. We'll have to, we'll have to talk about that later. Cause now yeah, I have we questions, can. but <laughs> This is, all, um, but yeah, so IFF, I mean, it's tough, right? I mean, it's, they're, they're trying to treat, treat you like it's a fighter squadron and stuff. Was that, I mean, was it just painful or was it just a challenge that you just sucked it up and, and got through or cooperate to graduate? I mean, how'd you, how'd you manage? Yeah. The funny thing is it's not the flying that I remember being difficult, even though I know it was, it was at Columbus as well. And it was the peak of the summer. So it was painfully hot. But it was learning all of the new style of things. And like you start to get exposed to all the threats while you're there. And it's just a lot of it's a lot of data yeah. to memorize. And then. I mean, this was in 2011. Yeah, 2011. Yeah. So quite a while ago now, there was definitely a culture in IFF that isn't there anymore in the fighter squadrons where it was a weird spot to be as a female. Like, yeah. I'd love to say that it wasn't a factor, but there was some like stuff where I was like, oh, this is how it is. And it's like, I just conform because what else am I going to do? Like, this is, this is where I'm at now. And so that was kind of the first exposure to that. Um, it hadn't been a thing through pilot training at all. And yeah. it was just a little bit of a shock. So I got through it. My class was amazing. My classmates in IFF were great, but it was, that was a tough program as well. Yeah. Well, so from there, did you go Sear and the Fuge or did you go, I guess the Fuge would be next, huh? Yeah, I think the center Fuge, those all kind of run together. It was like one training after another. Water survival, which is awesome. 
sear up in Spokane, which is not so awesome, but I really like camping. So I actually enjoyed running around in the woods. <laughs> um, and then, and I was in, I was at the end of May, so it was nice out. Uh, and then the centrifuge, which no one enjoys. It's terrible. Now, is it true? Girls pull G's easier. That's what I need to know. Everybody's going to ask you that. <laughs> I think it's based on your size, right? Yeah. I think it's based on the distance the blood has to travel from your heart. I'm 5'10", so I left that advantage at the door because there's several <laughs> male pilots that are shorter than me. Yeah, um, for sure. I think for the ladies that are like 5'4", five, 5'5", five, five, it's an advantage for sure. But anyone can did pull you with the right training. Did you have the A tags back then? Was this an A tags no, or non A tags? We got the A tags at like my last year uh, in Masala, so I was a couple okay. years into my first combat squad. All right, so you 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 did the real deal. Oh, oh, yeah. you, you did the the full up uh, thing. So, talk to me about. Did you go to Luke? Is that next? I did. Yep, the B course. Talk to Luke. me about the Viper first time. Uh, it was awesome. It was again like this is super cool. I'm super excited. I. I did it. I made it to the place. It, then it was also, wow, there's a lot more to this than I thought there was. <laughs> right. So turns out just flying and being a good pilot is a very small portion of being a good fighter pilot. Um, yeah. And I started to see that in the B course. And that became much more apparent when I got to my first combat squadron. Yeah. I mean, you talked about that a little bit with IFF. I mean, I noticed it at the B course. That's where that, you know, this is a fighter squadron. and this is a fighter culture. Was that, were you already prepared? Haven't seen a little bit of it at IFF or was it even more of a kind of, oh, wow, what am I, what am I getting myself into here? Is this, was it just tough? I think it was a little bit of an extension of the same type of thing. Um, I definitely felt overwhelmed at points, just trying to learn all the information. And the, the flying part came again pretty naturally, but the assessing things under high G was challenging, which turns out is challenging for everyone. Um, at the time, I thought I was probably the only one that found it challenging because I had a, a misperception uh, of how I was doing compared to everyone else. Um, and then just the, the amount of information you had to learn went up drastically. And now you're in a spot where the T6, you know, you're going to fly that for six months. So you could get on top of those systems and you're like, okay, I, I know enough that I can be successful in this program. We're good. Yeah. And then the same with the T38. Now you get to the F16. You're like, well, this is my career. And there's the systems are much more complicated on the aircraft itself. And then you have all the additional pods and radar and all that kind of thing. And then you have all the weapons. So that adds another layer of general knowledge you need to know. And then you have all the enemy systems and you're like, oh, this is like being a doctor all of a sudden. <laughs> graduate level of work. I mean, it really yeah. is. I mean, it's, yeah. it's much higher level. So assignment night comes. Did you have a preference? I mean, did you want to go to Japan or like what were you thinking there? I wanted just like everyone else to go to Europe. <laughs> like no. everyone wants to go to Aviano or Spang Dalam, so Italy or Germany. Um, my class rolled dice to oh, really? I mean, there's really no great way to do it. So we rolled dice and I forget if it was who rolled the lowest numbers or what got to pick first. And Misawa was, I don't know, maybe like fifth on my list. And that's, we had like three, three of us went to Misawa. So there were quite a few. Um, and that's where I ended up. I was excited to live overseas. I was, I was excited to go to any base overseas, but Europe was definitely my first choice. Yeah, well, that's another transition too, because now block fifties, right? You're now you're even, even more learning more systems and a new mission. Um, yeah. What did you think about you know transitioning and going to your first combat squadron? It was it was tough, and I talk about that quite a bit now. Um, it's part of the story that I tell with what I'm doing now. But the B course, it was noticeable. But I did find I probably was middle of the pack in my class. And then, but you have your peers, right? So you're not the only one going through that program. There's like 18 of us all doing the same thing. So you have people that are studying together and you can lean on. And then you get to the CAF, to your first squadron. And I was the only new Lieutenant, you know, like everyone else was quite a bit ahead of me. And the last person that had PCS in had been there several months at that point. And so you, 
people say they're there to help if you have any questions, but everyone's so busy that you find yourself alone a lot of the time in the vault trying to study. And when you first dive into all those publications, it's like alphabet soup. And so you're yeah. having to like spend time just looking up what the acronyms mean to even have context to be able to read the documents. Um, so it definitely piled up there. And that was the first point where I was like, oh, I might have stepped into something that I'm actually not good enough to do. And now I'm kind of stuck here because Air Force <laughs> put a whole lot of money to train me. And also yeah. this is like, this has been the shiny penny that I was running towards for five years at that point that I wanted so bad. And then I got there and it was like, I suddenly definitely was like, I'm not good enough to be here. I'm an imposter. Everyone else is smarter than me, better than me. And it was a reality check, I think, because I had always just been good at things and I was a high achiever. And so this was the first time that I like really got pushed back and putting in the work to study was still didn't feel like it was enough. Did you feel like, I mean, because you've talked about that on your your uh, Instagram, Facebook, and, and even your, your webpage about it, imposter theory. Is that the first time you started experiencing that? Or is it something that you had dealt with, you know, kind of even before, just at a smaller level? Uh, was it just something you, you'd been dealing with before? The very first time I <clears throat> doubted if I was good enough to go through a program was a very short period at the start of IFS when it was just okay. like fire hose, That's like the first week of the program. I was up till midnight studying and knowing I had to wake up at 5 a.m. and feeling like I wasn't making any traction. Mm -hmm. But that was very short lived. And so by the end of that program, I felt like I was doing fine. Pilot training, honestly, I was pretty comfortable the whole time. And IFS, or sorry, IFF, it was more of a cultural thing, less of the flying thing. So getting to my first combat squadron was the first time where I hit that block and then just stayed there for an extended period of time. Because Masao is a seed squadron as well. So your suppression of enemy air defenses for everyone that doesn't know, but you are learning all of the enemy's surface air missile systems. And it's 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 complicated. There is so yeah. much to know. Yeah. Well, so taking a step back, because somebody in the chat just said I forgot to ask you. First flight in the F-16, light in the afterburner. What did you think oh. would be? Great, greatest feeling in the world. It's incredible. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you kind of feel like you should know what to expect after flying the T-38, but it's way better. <laughs> Did it bring you back to when you were looking at the F-15s taking off and you were like, yeah, I made the right choice. Uh, yeah, for sure. I love the jet. It was challenging, but it was, like I said, it wasn't the flying. It was all of the other things piled yeah. on top of the flying. So as a young Lieutenant now, you know, at your, your calf squadron, um, how, I mean, how did you end up coping with that? Like, how did you overcome? Did you have like techniques? Did you go and, you know, spend a whole bunch of time in the gym and, you know, kind of work out the frustration or was it, did you have any way to kind of cope with it? I mean, that you bring that up. I definitely worked out a lot, which helped. Um, but I would say I didn't cope with it super well. Like if I could mm. go back, I would have done a lot of things differently. Um, I think I really felt like I had to prove myself and, some of that was there were two women, myself and um, one other in a squadron of 40 something pilots and just feeling like you were under a microscope and you couldn't, you had to do everything better than anyone else and you couldn't show weakness. And that might've worked fine if I just rolled in there and crushed it and understood everything right away. But I didn't, but I was in a spot where I did not want to, admit that. And I didn't want to put myself out there at all. And so there were a lot of times I should have found a mentor and been like, Hey, I'm struggling. I need help or, you know, ask questions. And I wouldn't because I didn't want people to know. And yeah. that really held me back. I could have been a much better pilot that first assignment than I was. I wasn't terrible, but I was just okay. And I think looking back, I, I regret's not the right word because I learned a lot from it, but I don't think I performed up to the level that I want to perform up to yeah. at that first assignment. And that was pretty much the entire three years that I was there. So it, it took a while. It was not until my next move to my next squadron that I was like, all right, enough of this. And I kind of consciously 
made a shift in how I was seeing things. Yeah. So, I mean, let's talk about that. So you ended up going to a very experienced squadron, right? The yeah. composite squadron, essentially active duty and reserve uh, at Carswell. Uh, how did you choose that assignment or was it chosen for you? I mean, what, what brought you to Fort Worth? I did put that as my first choice on my list of assignments, but that can, that can go anyway. You can get your last choice. You just never know. It's what the air force <laughs> needs. They had one spot for an experienced F-16 pilot. That was a captain to be the flight commander there for the active duty pilots um, with the majority of the squadron being, like you said, experienced reservists. I kind of took a shot in the dark and put that as my very first choice. I was kind of, not kind of, I was super burned out coming off of Misawa, um, just with all the internal struggle stuff I was going with and the ops tempo there and being the chief of scheduling, which is like the worst job ever. Oh. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Just no. moving all the fucks around the board. <laughs> um, yeah. And I could have handled it better. It was partially self-induced, but I was just like grasping for a chance to come up for air coming off of that mm. assignment. And I knew TFI would give me that. And so that is why I put it first, even over going to Italy or Germany at that point. Um, and I got it and it was the perfect time for that assignment to come along. Awesome. Awesome. Yeah. So uh, just on a more fun flying, how did you like the block 30 versus the block 50 performance wise? Was it everything it was, you hoped it to be? Yeah, it was, it was downgrade, obviously, somewhat. But we were also I showed up in the middle of a spin up to go to Afghanistan so we were doing casts and that jet is very good at that. And it has the center display and it has all these cool, cool avionics that are made for doing close air support. And we trained really hard to get super proficient at that specific mission. And it was so nice to be good at that and yeah. feel like, you know, you had your arms around it finally. Um, so I didn't, I didn't miss the performance as much as I would have. I think if we hadn't been in that phase in the squadron when I showed up. Did you, so were you the only female fighter pilot when you showed up uh, at Carswell as well? Yeah, I was actually the first one that's ever been in that squadron and they still haven't had one since. So, <laughs> which you think would be a thing, um, especially rolling in with a bunch of reservists who are all a couple of generations removed from where I was at. You know, a lot of them are, they've been in for close to 20 years. And I'm showing up right. in, but that squadron was amazing. They clearly as reservists and they hire people, they know they're not just there for a three year assignment. They're there for 10 years, for 15 years. So they pick personalities that are going to fit well. And they had built this incredible squadron of almost like a family. And the experience level was incredible. So there were, I think we were like, I don't know, like 10 weapon school graduates or something in one squadron and some of them had deployed to Afghanistan, you know, six times, eight times. Like they, they're like, you kind of remove the egos. I think that came with young fighter pilots where you felt like you had to prove yourself. And they were all just like, yeah, we, we don't need to show off. <laughs> like we know our shit and like, we're comfortable with it. We're confident, but we're not arrogant. And that atmosphere was, so refreshing and i feel like they all just brought me in with open arms and they really mentored me uh going into my first deployment and it was the perfect atmosphere to step into coming off of my first assignment and kind of what i struggled with there yeah so talk to me about your first deployment like how was that um you know coming off the ops tempo from the active duty side now you're deploying with a bunch of really experienced reservists yeah. like what was that like it was awesome. I wish I got to deploy longer. And again, with them, um, there was, it was just a tight knit group and you always had your people you work out with and you always had your people you go to chat with and you always had your wingman you're flying with. And even when we were blended with the Makos, um, because that's the sister squadron of the SPAD. So out of down by Miami Homestead, oh, I've never met a lot of them, but you know, after a few weeks, everyone just got along really well. There was very limited personality conflicts or drama. And it was a really cool environment because all of the day-to-day -day stresses are kind of removed. And you're like, 
I can work out every day. I can go <laughs> do the actual mission and do some really cool stuff. And then I can eat ice cream every day because I worked out every day. <laughs> like, yeah, I really liked being deployed. Well, so, you know, we talked about the, the imposter stuff. Was that all alleviated at this point now that you're kind of more comfortable and you feel more like, you know, you fit in there and, and more at home? I think I got better at managing it um, where I would still do the thing, even if I was scared, where before I had kind of just been like paralyzed by worrying about failing. And so I wouldn't, I wouldn't volunteer for things. I wouldn't put myself out there. Um, once I got to the spads, I was not happy with where I was at. And I, you know, I'm kind of a perfectionist and an overachiever just by nature. And so I wanted to fix it. And so I made a conscious decision that I would start doing all of these things that I had wanted to do, but that were kind of uncomfortable and a little bit scary. And that started with my hobbies and definitely trickled into my professional life with deploying for the first time. Um, I volunteered to go to Poland and instruct there, which was amazing. Um, and I was, I, that's a whole, we're going out of order slightly, but that was after that's I fine. deployed. That's that's fine. Yeah. How, what, what did you instruct? Like, did you go fly, like make, fly in the back seat and make 29s? Did you go do any stuff? No, like in their F 16s. Oh, okay. Uh, did you yeah. get to fight the MiG 29 at all? I, unfortunately, no, that was like, I was asking the whole time I was there. I was like, guys, <laughs> like, I know you think this isn't a big deal, but yeah. so, like, half their squadron was deployed. They had like a lot of going on at the time. So now I got to do like flug upgrades and put people through like, their mission qualification training and their flight lead upgrades. So I was flying with guys that had gone through Tucson. So they had gone through the American B course, mm -hmm. but now they're back in their home country and it was super cool. But I kind of see that decision to put my name in to go do that was a pretty pivotal moment because that was summer of 2017. I had been with the SPADs for about a year and a half. I had deployed with them the summer before. And I was doing all these things to really push my limits outside my comfort zone and like try to get rid of that little voice of self-doubt that I've really been dealing with in Misawa. And I had been doing that really successfully and I was so happy. I like, I felt like I was just thriving. And yeah. this email came out from, from the reserves to other reserve pilots asking for instructors to go to Poland for the summer I was active duty. Um, the only requirement was that you were an IP and instructor. And I had just finished my upgrade like three days before that email came out. So I am like the greenest instructor possible. <laughs> and my initial reaction was like, this sounds super cool. They have like these cool jets with the conformal fuel tanks and the drogue chute. And I've never been to Poland. I would love to travel there. How cool to live there for the summer. And then I was like, well, am I really qualified to do this? I'm brand new. Also, they don't have any female pilots. Like, how's that going to go over? Are they going to listen to me? So all those doubts, right? Yeah. And and I recognized it, though, this time. And I was like, screw that. And I, I went to my boss. And I was like, can I apply for this, even though I'm active duty? And they're like, oh, let's check. I expected to go into the bar that day and have all the reservists be like, did you guys see that awesome opportunity to go to Poland? And I like walk in there. I'm like, did you guys see that awesome opportunity? And they're all like, <laughs> uh, the kids, we have summer vacation, the airlines. Yeah. And I'm like, yeah, I'll go. Um, so I went and it was hard, but it was awesome. Yeah. Is that the Warhawks? Is that Poland Warhawks? I think they have a YouTube channel. They there's some might. Viper squadron. Yeah. There's some Viper squadron. I always see they're posting VFM videos. I think it's awesome, but yeah, I feel uh, like the tigers. <laughs> yeah, no, that's, that's a, that's a great experience. And, so you, did you come back and like, Hey guys, guess what I did this, you know, this summer. I mean, was it, uh, was it pretty, did you, did you bring a lot back to the squadron after doing that? I think they were all really interested in how it went. And I think it made me more confident as an instructor, as pretty much any flight does when you just finish the upgrade, cause you really yeah. don't know what you're doing yet. Um, but it was just a super memorable experience and, I made a lot of great friends with those other people that were around my same age that had gone through Tucson. Uh, and it was, they were just so welcoming. It was, it was cool. And it was amazing to live in Poland 
and I traveled a bunch while I was there on the weekends and it was just, it was a cool experience. Yeah. Wow. So from there, did you start thinking like, what made you decide, Hey, next thing I'm going to do is be a Thunderbird. <laughs> yeah. Um, so my time at Fort Worth was coming to an end and I got a follow on to Holloman to go be a B course instructor, which wasn't my first choice of locations, but else I thought I would like teaching there and it wasn't that big a deal. So I had already, my orders were in the works. I was scheduling my household goods, all that stuff. And I saw an email from the Thunderbirds that it was like, Hey, last chance to apply. We've already sent out an email that you probably never opened or automatically deleted. <laughs> and here's like, if you want to apply to be on the team, this is the last chance. And the packages were due like the following week. It was like five days later. And for whatever reason, as I'm scrolling through my email, working on out processing, I see that and I open it and I scroll down and read through the requirements and I met all of them. And I was like, huh, I mean, Holloman would be cool, but I'm in a great spot in my career to apply for this. And honestly, uh, people had asked me if I wanted to apply for the Thunderbirds several times throughout my career. And I had always said, oh, I don't, I haven't really thought about it. <laughs> and that's because it interested me, but I didn't think I was a good enough pilot to be on the team. Like that was my honest really? assessment was I did not have a good idea of what the training was actually like and what the flying was actually like. And so I was like, I'm not that good at flying formation. I'm like, I'm not good enough to be on the team. And again, all that kind of intentional mindset ship thing stuff I did over those couple of years with the spads paid off. Cause in that moment I was like, huh, I meet all these requirements. This sounds fun. Why not try to apply? And I went to my boss yeah. and he was amazing. Cause I was like, uh, boss, I know I'm supposed to PCS here in like two months to Holloman. But what do you think about this? And he was like, I think you'd be great for that job. Like, let's do it. What do we have to make happen? And so we got letters of recommendations from generals and pulled all my records and all that stuff in like three days and got the package in on the last day. Um, and I ended up getting hired. <laughs> wow. Wow. Is that it? So is that a super squirrel secret interview process or is that something that they let you talk about after? No, I can talk about it for sure. Uh, it's pretty lengthy and intense. Um, the paper, the package that I submitted was 40 something pages. It's all your performance reports, all your check rides, your PT tests, a photo, like all, all the things. And then like a statement of why you want to be on the team. And then they review that stuff for any big red flags, like hooked check rides or failed PT tests or that kind of thing. They kind of eliminate those people generally. And then I think like 30 people applied. They went through the records and picked 12 of us to come out to be semi-finalists. So we actually came out on the road, went to an air show with the current team, met everyone, got to shadow everything, the brief, the debrief, be at show center, kind of see what the operations tempo is like at an air show. And then we did interviews with the commander and the DO. And I think we interviewed with the wing commander, which was General Levitt. Um, a one star at the time. And that was the first round. And a lot of it is them kind of just assessing your personality and how you're going to fit in with the other personalities, because with such a small group and being on the road over 200 days a year, Ooh. you're in a pressure cooker and the personalities have to get along. Like the having a huge personality conflict and a bunch of drama is the most stressful thing, way more than any of the flying. So that's a huge part of it. So 12 of us. And then maybe a month or two later, we find out who made the finalists. So they brought six of us back out to do that all again, shadow for another weekend. And then we do a panel interview where all 12 of the current officers are at a table and you're, you sit at the head of the table and they all go around and ask you questions, which is fairly stressful. Yeah. Um, yeah, it was, it was funny once I was on the team and doing the interviews to like watch how people handle that in different ways. <laughs> um, and then you leave and you wait again and finally get a phone call to so is there tell you any flying? Yeah. Is there any so there flying wasn't. at all? In there wasn't, but last year we brought it back for the first time in a really long time. We decided to add the flying interview back in. And so now 
the applicants go through those show weekends and then they come out to Nellis for a week and the team schedules it when they have a weekend where they don't have a show. And so they can be home the whole week and they actually put them in the front seat of a D model and they go through a very specific profile of trying to fly a loop and a roll and do all the Thunderbird calm. Cause there's a lot of weird stuff the team does that you don't normally do. Um, yeah. Yeah. And no one's good at it at that point. It's, <laughs> it's really just a chance to see how much they prepared and how they react when they're overwhelmed. Yeah. Yeah. So you got the, sorry, I, I interrupted you, but you got the call and I mean, what was that like? Uh, I was, I was the soft at the time. So I was supervisor of flying for those that don't know. And my shift had just started. So I was actually out in the truck with the light on the top driving the runway <laughs> and I was off the runway. Luckily I was driving across the <laughs> ramp over to the gate that like went back out onto the street and my phone started ringing and I saw that it was the Thunderbird exec. Cause I had her number in my phone and I just pulled over on the side of the ramp and put the flashers on and I answered it. And I don't even, they all just started yelling congratulations. So I knew immediately that I had made the team. Awesome. Awesome. So what's the transition like to becoming a Thunderbird pilot? There's a, there's a lot that goes into it. The obvious stuff of moving to a new base, here to Vegas, to Nellis, and the normal stuff you would do when you go to a new squadron. Then there's a lot of other stuff, though, like public affairs training and getting put on camera and doing interviews and getting fit for a very fitted, very tight blue suit and getting that tailored over and over and over until it fits enough so you can sit down, but so it's not loose <laughs> at all. It's a very fine line between the two. Um, and then there's a whole lot of Thunderbird isms, like very specific things that the team does with radio calls, with just, just how things are done in the squadron. So there's a lot of academics you have to go through. Um, and then you start flying. And when I went through, I'm trying to think, Initially, it was just me and the lead solo that was on his way out of the squadron going out as a two ship to fly solo maneuvers to get exposure to, all right, flip upside down and see how that goes for you. You think it's really simple? It, no, everyone rolls upside down and then they push too much and they end up climbing and pulling like negative two to three G's and everything in the cockpit just explodes. All your, your pens leave your pocket. Like... Um, so that takes a lot of practice, just something as simple as flopping inverted at 10,000 feet cruising into the airspace. You have to do it over and over and over before you oh, get yeah. what you see at a hundred feet for a show. And then there are other flights where you go out with Thunderbird one on his wing and flying off the source because I flew, you have one, you have two, and then I flew off of two. So I was twice removed, but you start flying off the source because it's much easier than flying at the end of the whip, doing a loop and a roll and you're far away and you're overcorrecting and especially the roll and you just do it over and over and over until you get a little bit better each day and four months and a hundred plus flights later, you have your first air show. Oh my God. So was this something that was an easy transition for you or was it something that, you know, you were like, like what was the most difficult part and what was kind of the easiest part? The flying was harder than I thought it would be, but everyone experiences that the same. And it was very obvious that everyone was going through that learning curve. And it was also very exciting. Um, the hardest thing was definitely the role for me when we came all six together and I was, on the wing of number two is on the wing of number one and I'm on the left side and we're rolling left. So that maneuver yeah. being on the inside of the roll, um, away from the axis so far took me like half of the first show season to get anywhere close to staying in, which is very frustrating. Um, and then solo maneuvers, you'd think those would be pretty easy because it's just one jet that I've already been flying for 10 years or nine years at the point um, that I joined the squadron but it's just such different flying. Like in the F-16 Airborne, you know, you're like never touching the rudder. Like right. you're, you don't use your feet at all. Flying the solo profile, I was, you know, doing a knife edge with 
full rudder deflection to keep me from diving towards the ground, or I'm slipping the jet to kill energy as I'm doing a rejoin with a hundred knots of closure, a thousand feet. And it was just, you're operating on, on the edge the entire time. So it takes a lot of time to get to that point. Yeah. Was it something, I mean, I watched a video of the blue angels, like they like chair fly every brief. Yeah. Is that something you guys would do as well before every show? And was not it that this, creepy? Not the extent that they do. <laughs> I, this is going to get back to them because they're our friends. We actually did a lot of stuff with them. Like <laughs> we all know each other, but the first time you sit in on a blue angels brief, and you see the chair flying portion, people who have already been there are like, hey, just a heads up, this is going to happen. You cannot burst out laughing in the middle of the brief. <laughs> you need to keep it together. Do not look at each other. Do not make eye contact with your friends because the whole thing's so awkward. And so you just sit in there and you're like, this is weird. You just get, like, I'm sure we did some weird stuff too, I'm sure, but it just becomes so normal to you that you don't think it's weird. The chair flying wow. thing, we would like talk through the maneuvers in the order with a map of the airspace, mm -hmm. but everyone has their eyes open. You're kind of just drawing the lines with a pen. <laughs> they take it to the extreme, um, which it works for them. It's it's fine. But yeah, it, it can be uncomfortable the first time you sit in on a brief. Well, so, I mean, I guess that to me, it bring, brings up another question. This whole time, are you just air show centric or would you guys go out and do like CT or continuation training BFM. Would you, would you do anything other than fingertip and the demos and stuff? Or was it just, no. we have one mission and this is all we do. So nothing yeah. else. No. And the there, there's three show types, right? Depending on the weather, there's the high show, the low show and the flat show. So you, so much goes into not just being really good at the maneuvers, but also being really good at the timing between mm -hmm the solos and the timing between the solos and the diamond and like deconfliction behind the line and the narration and the music that to stay proficient at just doing the demo, you need it. Like if we didn't fly for a week, it was very noticeable to us. Like you would feel yeah. very rusty. You had to be flying during training season. We would fly 10 times a week. Sometimes we would double turn five days in a row. Jesus. Yeah. Jeez. Wow. Yeah. Which was exhausting. But how long are the sorties? Uh, just shy of an hour. Wow. That's and pulling nine G's every single time. Yeah. Yeah. No, that, I mean, that was a thing that became a factor um, at the end of my first training season, March of 2019. I started to have lower back pain and I still have it now every day. Oh, wow. So hoping it goes away the longer I'm out of the jet. But it's been seven months since I've flown and it's not going away at all. So we'll see what happens, but it, it's hard on the body. The hardest, the most difficult flying I did and the hardest on my body of any flying I did for sure. Was it tough with the constantly being on the road too? I mean, yes. was that, was that like also like mentally taxing? Just the fact that you're always in a hotel, you're always under the microscope, you know, public eye kind of stuff. Yeah. That's the hardest part of the job. Like the people would ask me all the time what the best part of the job is. And that was, being able to inspire people, especially kids. That was the coolest part of the job. The worst part of the job was the schedule. Um, on average, it varies a little bit season by season, but 240 days a year is the standard answer of how long we're gone. And March till November, you are gone every single weekend from Thursday, you fly cross country, Friday, you practice Saturday, Sunday, air shows, Monday, you fly cross country, back to Nellis, maybe sometimes you'll stay out on the road. If it's like two East coast shows back to back, cause it doesn't make sense to hop all the way across. Right. So you're always balancing the demands of getting a tanker, flying the jets cross country, all of our bodies swinging three time zones with keeping people away from their families for weeks at a time, instead of four or five days at a time. Um, yeah, you, it's exhausting. You, it, it accumulates. So, about this time of the year, this year's team is, is going to be tired. They're going to look really good because they're, they've come together as a team and their flying is very proficient. So from now until the end of the season are like the best air shows you'll see, but they're also exhausted. Wow. Were you, uh, did you have a family by this point? <coughs> Excuse me. That sounded great. Uh, yes. So I, 
met my husband right after I moved to Vegas for the Thunderbirds. So funny story, actually. Uh, he had a, at the time, six year old or about to turn six. So my stepson's nine now. Um, I met my husband on Bumble and oh. I, I tell this story <laughs> because it, it's funny. It's You'll awesome. appreciate it. Um, for those that don't know Bumble, the you swipe right on someone that they swipe right on you as well. You match, but the woman has to send the first message. It's kind of like to eliminate creepy dudes. Sorry to everyone. I just offended, but it, uh, it's a good, it's a good model. And so I had matched with him and you have 24 hours to send a message or if that match disappears, they want to like drive people to actually take action and not just sit there. And so I matched with him, but I thought he was intimidating because he was too good looking. I was like, <laughs> oh, he probably like accidentally, this is the imposter syndrome, right? He like probably accidentally swiped right on me. Um, I'm just, so I had decided that I was just going to let it time out. I wasn't going to send him a message as stupid as that is. And I was going to let the match time out and go on with my life. And then right when it was about to end, he used an extend, which you can, as a guy, you can like pay to extend it another 24 hours. And I was like, okay, he probably didn't accidentally swipe right and accidentally use an extend. So like, let's at least send him a message. And I wish I could remember what I told him or said to him in the first message. I can't, but I do remember what he said to me. And in my profile, I had Air Force pilot, but no further details than that. And he was like, oh, hey, what do you fly? And I was like, F-16s. Like, this is going to be cool. And his response was, I prefer the A-10. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah, it's awesome. And I was just like, <laughs> "Thanks." Oh, what? Oh. what is this? And so well, I had gone on a bunch of first dates where my job was like the only thing they wanted to talk about. And I actually got really mm. annoying. And <laughs> so this was a little bit refreshing and I was intrigued. I was like, okay. Um, I don't so like your tactics. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we went on a date that was supposed to be um, an hour on a Sunday night. I was like, I only have one hour to meet you for a beer at 5 PM. I don't have time to do that. I got to wake up really early the next morning. We were there for like five hours and turns out he was in the Marines and he had been in Fallujah in 2005 of all times. And he was partial to A-10s for a very good reason. And Valid. yeah, it totally made sense, right? And I'm from, like I said, Wisconsin. He's from Indiana, a really small town, like a hundred people. And we're both in Vegas. So both military backgrounds, both from the Midwest, small towns, both love outdoor stuff. So it was it was like, oh, this is so much better than all the other dates. And we got married six months <laughs> Awesome. And then it's tough because now you're on the road. Uh, yeah, we the rest of your career. Yeah, the, our whole marriage until just seven months ago was me being gone most of the time. So quite the adjustment for me to work from home when I'm not on the road now doing doing speaking stuff. But um, that made it a lot harder. I think the team is actually easier for people that don't have families yeah. because you can really just embrace all the cool experiences you're getting to do without yeah. the guilt of like. I want to tell my husband or wife about this super amazing thing I'm doing. Meanwhile, they're at home with the kids holding down the fort and they're like, oh, cool. Great. You got to meet yeah. so-and-so and they bought you a steak dinner. And then you got to go to the suites at the Indy 500. Good. Tell me more. Like <laughs> that doesn't necessarily but, go over really well with your spouse. <laughs> well, you so, are a rock star, right? I mean, everybody, I mean, this is about as close as a air force fighter pilot gets to being a rock star without being a rock star. Yeah, I, I always said it was like, it was like the schedule of a band on tour with like some of the perks, but not any of the money. <laughs> yeah. So it was kind of a weird spot to be in. You had the same schedule, though, as like a professional athlete or a band on a tour. Yeah. Well, so the dealing with, I mean, the, the crowds and the people, like, was it a mix of like very inspired kids that were like hey this is awesome and then the weirdos and then the cool people like what what yep. was kind of the the tempo with that i mean you pretty much just summed it up um, <laughs> i okay. i struggled with that part a little bit because i am more reserved and a little bit introverted and once i'm there and i'm interacting with like 
sometimes I, you would meet the most incredible people that had just incredible stories or you would, I'd have a conversation with, you know, a 10 year old girl and I could just tell like her, her perception of what was possible for her just opened up. And that was so rewarding to do that. Awesome. And I loved it. And I felt like it, like I felt full of energy when I was in the moment, but when I would, when there was a lull in the conversation, I was like, would hit a wall. Awkward. I was so exhausted. <laughs> yeah. I had to hide in my hotel room. I would like, people would be like, Oh, it's, it's Sunday night at the end of a show weekend. Let's all go to dinner. And I'm just like, I'm ordering Uber Eats, having a sushi bowl, sitting in my hotel bed and going to bed at 8 p.m. You have fun. Because I, I, it just drained me. My social battery was always on empty. Um, so that part got exhausting. And it was, that, it was tough because that was one of my favorite things and one of the hardest things. Did you get recognized like out in public, like just going to the gym or something? Uh, by the third season, that started to happen. And it's happened in some weird I remember the first time it happened was my first season on the team, but it was at an air show. Like we were in that city for a show. It was in the hotel. And I was like, okay, that makes sense. Like in the setting, um, in uniform, of course you got stopped all the time, but just in civilian clothes. By my third season though, I had built a decent sized social media following. And there were some like weird times. Um, we were at a major league baseball game in Kansas city. And I got out of my seat to walk up the stairs to go use the bathroom. We're in a huge stadium. And some I'm like walking up the aisle and some guy's like, hey, Mace, great show yesterday. And I was like, <laughs> and I was probably, I probably came across as super rude because I was so shocked and not expecting it that I just stared at him. <laughs> and then I, like, <laughs> stare at him. And then I kind of just <laughs> ran away. Um, and then, <laughs> yeah, and just recently, like, a month ago I was in Vegas and I was in the baggage claim coming back from a speaking thing, waiting for my suitcase and the security guard at the like information booth in baggage claim was like, ma'am, ma'am. And I'm like looking behind me because I'm not used to security guards like yelling. I'm like, what am I doing wrong? And he's like, come over here. And I'm like, me? and so I walk over there. He's like, Hey, you're Mace. And I was like, oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome. So yes, oh, it happens well, occasionally now, which is still strange for me. Yeah, I, I can, I can see that. And I, I understand. Um, so before we get on to moving on, how'd you get your call sign? People that's are going to ask the question. Uh, so in true fashion, I know someone asked this in the comments on your social media too, if I was going to tell this story. So, it is an acronym. I won't tell you exactly what each letter stands for because I like to say that for in person, but it was you know, early on in my assignment at Masala and I broke the mock. So you can maybe guess what the M stands for. I broke the mock when I wasn't supposed to um, and almost G-locked. So it was oh, a pretty geez. serious life event. And I, in my speaking that I do now, I you know dive into that a lot more um, with everything that happened. Um, it's, it's, it's a pretty crazy story for people that haven't flown a fighter jet, but it's kind I was gonna of say, cause I think I have the same story. <laughs> I, it's a common story really as yeah. terrifying as it is. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Well, um, so Thunderbird assignment, basically, did you have your choice of going wherever you wanted? Like what was on your mind as you wrapped up your final season? So I, I think TFI, you know, going to a reserve squadron, as cool as it is for that integration that happens, it also kind of shows you other options that are out there. And so leaving there, I was kind of like, okay, I would love to go back to the SPADs. I just love that squadron. I love the people. And then I met my husband here. And like I said, I have a stepson. And so that kind of anchors us in Las Vegas. Um, his mom's here. Like we just don't have the flexibility to move wherever we want at this point, which is fine. Although it's 110 degrees out today. So I don't like that part. Um, so that kind of already made a decision where I'm like, okay, active duty just doesn't fit my priorities really well at this point, because I would like to be able to balance my family a little bit better. And um, there were options to stay at Nellis and keep flying in the reserves, but none of them were super exciting to me. And my body was beat up. 
like the back pain, the neck pain, it becomes a thing. And I think I was on a track to medically disqualify myself, honestly, um, Mm -hmm. if it kept going the way it was going. And I am super active. I love to work out. I love outdoor adventure hobbies. And I want to be doing that stuff when I'm 50, not, you know, have my entire lifestyle be changed because of all these injuries. So there were a couple of things that made me consider, okay, so at this point, I'm like, I'm not going to stay on active duty. Um, and then you have the airlines, which is the most common thing that people do if they leave active duty as a pilot, of course. And there's obviously yeah. a huge demand right now. And you can get paid a lot of money to not work a lot of days. And sure. I think it works works great for so many people. And I love that that's an option. I just, I was seriously considering it for quite a while, but I just didn't think I would feel super fulfilled doing it. Um, which I, I know the fact that you don't take it home with you and you can, you know, do your flights and then walk home and not have any baggage from it is a huge draw for a lot of people. But I really, really loved being able to impact people in a positive way. And I wanted to keep doing that. So that's when I really started to consider all the options. If I'm not going to stay on active duty and I'm not going to go to the airlines, what is out there for me? Yeah. And here we are. What, what, what was out there? What, what have you transitioned to? Well, I never thought I'd be an entrepreneur, but here I am figuring it out as I go. Um, I had people ask me to speak at events quite a bit while I was on the team. Um, just as I got a lot of exposure, just the timing and being on a few like national level, the Kelly Clarkson show, um, smarter every day, that kind of thing. Like those are really cool experiences. They also gave me a lot of exposure. And so people would ask me to speak at stuff and I just couldn't do it while I was on active duty. Um, you just, you don't have the time while you're on the team and there's a whole, thing and conflict of interest and being paid and all the things while you're on active duty. So I just couldn't do it at all. But that started to clue me in that there was an opportunity to actually make a living while still inspiring people and impacting people the same way I was while I was in a blue uniform. And so I started to explore that a little bit further. And someone asked me to speak right after I transitioned off of active duty, like six months prior, they were like, Hey, are you available these dates? Here's what we can pay you. Like, this is the audience. And I was, that was the tipping point where I was like, yes, let's do it. And I created an LLC like the next day and started digging into all the things. And as I tend to do, when I like set something as a goal, I jumped in head first, no safety net. Like this is what we're doing, but I'm confident I can figure it out. So we're four or five months in and I don't regret the decision at all. It's a little bit of a roller coaster. There's, days where I'm like so excited because I just got booked to speak at, you know, a fortune 100 company. And I'm like, Holy crap, I am doing this for real. And the audience feedback is great. And then there's days where I look at my calendar and I'm like, I'm rarely busy, but I don't have a lot of money coming in. And (laughs) And that's something you experience when you're, you know, working for the government, you're getting a paycheck every two weeks. So it's, it's awesome, but it's stressful. <laughs> yeah, well, you know, you eat what you kill. Now you're you're actually going out and and earning earning money as an entrepreneur, which is awesome. So, did your being able to conquer your kind of doubts in you know the spads and and in that transition? Do you think that helped you with this endeavor as well? I mean, is it or has it been one of those things that you can now share with people and still manage yourself? Totally. And that's the bulk of what I talk about when I'm on stage. It's there's of course parts about flying for the Thunderbirds and like the amazing things we got to do. And there's some really cool cockpit videos and that's kind of the attention getter. And that's kind of the epic story at the end, the comeback story. But in the middle is me being just very honest, honest and vulnerable with the audience about all the doubts I had and the things I struggled with and, not feeling like I belonged in this culture and working towards something forever and then getting there and being like, huh, I, I actually am not good enough to do this. And it's just something that resonates with people so much. I didn't realize how much it would resonate until I actually got in front of audiences and started getting feedback. And there are so many people that will come up to me afterwards or send me an email. And it's 
people you wouldn't expect. It's your CEOs or it's someone who from the outside is just crushing it. And they're like, I have struggled with my self doubt, my, and like fearing failure and all these things, my whole career. And to hear you, someone who they like look up to because they see the Thunderbird stuff on my resume and they're like, Oh, she must've, they put you on a pedestal. They're like, she must've had it all figured out. just knowing exactly what to do. And then you're like, no, this is actually the true story. And it all of a sudden they don't feel so alone. And it makes what you did a much more attainable goal for them. And maybe not yeah. literally what I did, but something to the same level. And it's just so cool to impact people. No, absolutely. You impacted me. I mean, I, I not just saying that you, your imposter syndrome, imposter theory, which you had talked about, you know, in one of your posts, you know, I'm looking at that going, you got it, you know, you get this. And you actually made a post, which I wanted to ask you about, about walking away, you know, about, you know, enjoying what you had when you had it, but then opening new doors, like kind of what was your, like, what inspired you to make that post? I get a lot of questions about how I could leave something that was so awesome. Like people are like, what are, what are you doing? Why would you, well, a lot of people don't realize that the Thunderbird assignment as, is only two years normally. And I actually did a third year because of the pandemic. So I was already on the bonus tour. Um, it comes to what you're doing next. So that was going to happen no matter what, but people romanticize the career field and they don't realize the demands that go into it, the stresses, the, all the things, the physical stuff, the mental stuff, the moving your family every three years, whatever it is. Um, and so I get questions all the time because people just couldn't understand. They're like, you know, I would give my right leg to be a fighter pilot and you're walking away from it by choice. Um, <clears throat> but I, knew I still wanted to have a direct impact on people. And of course you can do that in the career field, but I wanted it to be more face-to-face -face positive empowerment because that transition I went to while I was in the SPADS, I kind of did that for myself. And I was stuck in that rut for a solid three years. And that was not an easy battle to dig out of. And I think there are a lot of scenarios where it went the other way and I just stayed miserable and I hated it. And I never applied to the team. I never went to Poland. I didn't do any of that stuff. And I was just salty and unhappy that whole time. Um, and that realization that I went through then is what gave me the courage to do what I'm doing now and make that leap where I'm the only safety net because it made me realize that I get, this sounds so cliche, but it made me realize I get to manifest my destiny. Like I get to create the life I want and I have that capability and just taking that ownership and realizing my success and my failure both fall on my shoulders and I get to decide that is such a great place to be. It's scary sometimes, but it is awesome. And there's so much freedom that comes with it. Yeah. Yeah. You, you talk about people asking you about, you know, leaving, leaving the team, but you posted that because Top Gun Maverick, you try, you use that as an educational tool and Gosh. good heavens. Okay, right. <laughs> how, how dare you? But I mean, has that been tough? Just, just realizing that, you know, it's, it's a, it's an interesting world out there. Yeah. I, my husband will, he's like, don't read the comments. And like the more you put yourself out there, the more stuff like that's going to happen and you just need to get okay with it. And that's easy to say. And I know that logically, like the right. people that, and I have, I actually really value different opinions and having intelligent conversations about different topics, but the internet is a cruel place these days and people <laughs> will just roll in completely out of the blue with the most obscure, hateful things. And Every time that happens, I'm almost like, I just lost my faith in society, which is not true because for every negative person like that, there's like a hundred positives, but I think it's kind of human nature. You dwell on it. And I wish I could say that I just delete and block them, which I do sometimes. And it doesn't bother me, but it does bother me. Like they, those, they can hurt your feelings. And then you get mad at yourself because you're like, 
can I swear on this show? They're like, sure. like absolutely. They're like, what the hell? Who is this asshole <laughs> that is in their mom's basement that I is affecting my day? Like, how dare I give them that power? And it can be frustrating. Yeah. So I still yeah. I struggle with that sometimes. A hundred percent. No, I I completely agree. And so one of the things you were talking about about you know moving on to the, to the next chapter is there. Is there a book in the works, perhaps? Are we we're going to see multiple ways to hear this story? Yeah, you and I need to brainstorm on that offline because you're <laughs> obviously well versed in that space. Yeah, I definitely um, I have a couple, two different ones, like in the in the tank. I think right now it's just finding yeah, the time. Yeah. With the speaking stuff has been awesome and it's really taking off, and so that's kind of in the focus. And I've been when I have a few hours of free time you know, writing outlines and brainstorming. And um, it's definitely in the works. It's, I'm the type of person where I'm like, why do I not already have my book published? Why am I not doing 10 minutes <laughs> a month? Why am I not blah, blah, blah. And then people are like, Mace, you've been off of active duty for like four months. You should, like, you're doing good. Chill. Yeah. Um, Relax. Yeah. So yeah. in the works, it'll, I'll get there. <laughs> Uh, do you do any flying like civilian GA or anything? Uh, yeah, I just started doing uh, some GA flying. I, I needed a break for a while. And so just last month, um, one of my friends has a twin Comanche. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I flew out to California with her, which was great. And then she asked me to fly from Vegas to South Dakota with her in a twin Comanche, wow. which we That's did. A long trip. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, yeah. It was like a <laughs> two hop on the way there, um, six something hours of flight time. And then the way home, we had a headwind and we had to stop three times. Well, two stops in the middle. And it was eight hours and 20 minutes or something of flight time home. Oh. And it was turbulent the whole time. It's hot. Vegas in the summer, it's just turbulent and windy. Oh, no. All the landings were super cross windy. I'm like, this is hard. <laughs> maybe we should circle back in like October when the temperature yeah. up a little bit. I was like, this is not as fun as I thought it would be. Did you have to do a lot of pond crossings in the Viper? Um, I did a couple when I was in Japan, um, to Alaska, to Hawaii, to Guam. Uh, uh, see, yeah. yeah, you were you, you alluded to that earlier. Uh, I do not, uh, I'm not jealous of any female fighter pilot having to no. do any kind of long or anything really i don't logistically i don't even know how it's possible so yeah uh, much like everything else you get better at it with practice but i this is just funny i don't mind talking about it uh obviously there's like you have to get extended zippers on your flight suits and there's a whole balancing act of getting enough clearance to use a fiddle pack and even when you've done it a hundred times, because we were going cross country twice a week, every week on the team. So that was when I did it more than any other time other than deployed. You can't see what's happening. And so you're like, everything's good. Do, do, do. And then you lift up the piddle pack and it's like almost empty. And you're like, huh, that math does not add up. And you're like, well, how much more flight time do we have for this flight suit to dry? <laughs> Since I'm an adult and I just peed my pants, essentially. That's why the, the little vent, the little eyelet vent, oh, right. we've all it's, used it. Yeah. We've all used it. It's all, yeah. yeah. The bonus, though, on the Thunderbirds is that you would land at a show site and have to do a plane side interview with the news channel on camera immediately. And they would never know because it dries fairly quickly and you can't really see. But it was... I would, we talked to the other pilots, we'd be talking on the radio about it and stuff. And I was like, wouldn't it be funny if they knew as I'm like on camera in New York to a station that airs to all of New York city, that she's like just Peter pants an hour ago and she's 34 <laughs> years old. Like it, it's kind of just became a joke and something you just accept. Yeah, you do what you yeah. can to work with what you have. And I, I'm still wearing my dirty pee pants right now. Yeah. <laughs> From, all the cool <laughs> yeah well that's uh well that's so you did all the the flyovers for covid right yeah were you there when you well obviously you were there but you guys almost hit the helicopter the oh, helicopter yeah. popped up out of nowhere that was a traumatic event more traumatic for the solo on the other side for gumbo on the right side but um that was traumatic for the whole formation that was the last 
a uh, big set of city flyovers we did. We actually had the Nellis wing commander was in the back seat oh, of boy. I think number four. And that was the first we had already done the whole Eastern seaboard, um, Texas, Colorado. Like we had done most of the flyovers. We had been doing them for like two months at that point. That was the last big one. And we had like a couple that were tentative after that. And when we landed, he was just like, we're like, we're done. We're done. The risk, <laughs> the risk involved in the city flyovers is substantially higher than air shows. Yeah. They were, it was the most difficult flying I did on the team, which surprises people. We were in formation for so long. Yeah. That sounds, uh, well, well, I don't want to keep you too long. Do you have time to take questions from the kids at home before we, uh, adjourn? Um, there's, there's lots of questions. The first question is always the same question. What's your scariest moment besides that one in an aircraft? Yeah. I mean, the, the near G lock that I had in the was, was pretty scary. Um, obviously that there are several times in the demo when you'd hit turbulence or someone would make it too quick of an adjustment and you would be like, like just the quick, like flinch, but you were so well trained that you would react to it. And the crowd couldn't even tell. Um, I actually wrote about this recently in a newsletter. I hit a vulture in Colombia, oh, wow. like the country of Colombia. So yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm in South America and it was the travel or the practice day on Friday for our show. I was behind the shop, behind the line, which means behind like where the crowd would be. And I was rejoining with the other solo for that point where we go over the crowd, um, one below the other to rejoin all six of us. And so we got a lot of smash at that point. I was, something like 1900 feet above the ground and almost at 500 knots. And I just saw the flash of black and I felt, so I've hit some smaller birds before where you yeah. almost don't even notice until you land, unless you like saw it. This one I saw, but I also felt the entire jet like shake, like shudder. And it was right under my feet, which is obviously where the intake for the only engine is. Um, so that will get your attention. Uh, but the engine was fine. <laughs> it, there were feathers in it. They did have to do an engine swap, which we always bring a spare engine with, but it put two fist size holes through the metal on the, in the intake. So like from the outside and I actually, oh, wow. I, I wish I had it here. I, it's around here somewhere. It punched out the two pieces of metal from the outside in. And when they started to do the repair, you know, the intake has, the layer on the inside that you like look down and then it has the layer on the outside and there's space between the two and the two pieces of metal were just floating in there and they fished them out and they were like curled up completely like mangled. And I actually have them. I gave one to my, uh, my crew chief and I kept the other one. Um, but yeah, they, they found pieces of feather in the intake or inside the blades of the engine had to engine swap had to patch the jet and we actually that was friday we flew it home on monday so wow. maintenance, the maintenance team on the thunderbirds they're incredible and they we had one of our guys from nellis flying a part that they needed like physically carried it through mexico city in a carry-on down to columbia in like 24 hours to get it there they sourced sheet metal from the colombian air force like it was a whole thing it was a really impressive um, act of like cohesion between all the different assets that that made that jet flyable home. But that was a fairly eye opening experience uh, to land and see two holes in the jet. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Birds are dangerous. Yeah. And that was They're a just big, big bird. <laughs> it was big, huge. big bird. All right. Questions from the kids at home. Uh, are you a car girl? Sorry, I coughed right when you said that. Am I a what? A car. What, what kind of car do you drive, Camaro? So I guess the question is, are you a car girl? Do you like fast cars too? So, no, I actually don't <laughs> really care about sports cars. I got a new Bronco and I love it so much. It looks yeah, just yeah. like this. Visual aid. Well, con considering you're <laughs> a hiker, that, that makes sense. I would have guessed Jeep, but Bronco does fit in line so that... That, that checks. Yeah, I'm, I'm I love that, that. Thing. If I could have like the vintage restored Bronco, that would be like, my dream car. Like the OJ kind? It, no, more vintage than that. Oh, okay. 
Um, so you talked about this a little bit. Uh, did you actually, I mean, did you do any shows with the snowbirds? I mean, is there a big culture difference between our neighbors up north? We did quite a few shows with them. I don't think I ever sat in on a brief with them. I didn't get to fly with them, unfortunately. It was, we would always be practicing when they were briefing or vice versa, just with the way the schedules worked out. I think there's a lot of similarities for sure. And with the blues as well, all the demo teams are very, very similar with how they brief kind of the culture, how they dig into things in the debrief. There's small differences, but I would say way more stuff is the same than is different. Yeah. Uh, this comes from RTD. Do you think the Thunderbirds will fly the Viper for the foreseeable future? Any plans for a replacement platform? Yeah, that's a common question. I wish I knew. There's so many discussions about it. I don't think anyone knows yet. Um, I mean, who knows? Maybe the F-35, maybe a trainer. I hope not a trainer. I don't know. I think the sh show would use a, lose a little bit of its impact. I think the Viper will stay there for quite a while yet. Yeah, Viper's going to stick around, too. As a, yeah. I mean, it's got a life cycle on it. Although, if they put the A-10, just saying, your husband would be happier. Yeah. He loves the A-10 demo, the single jet or single aircraft <laughs> demo that they do. He, yeah. he loves that. It's his favorite part of an air show. <laughs> Did you get to do any backseat rides in anything other than the Viper? I flew in, I flew with the Blues. So I flew in a uh, Hornet before they switched to the, the Super Hornet. Um, yeah. Did, did they give you a cool. G suit or did nope. you do, so you rode, you did like they do then? Yeah. Which was a thing. Um, I mean, I pulled nine G's on a regular basis, but your body definitely gets used to having the G suit, especially the ATX and your yeah. muscles. It's like if you're a weightlifter and you always lifted with a weight belt and then someone mm -hmm. was like, all right, we're going to take, you know, 80% of your one rep max. And now you're going to do it with no belt and you've never done no belt before. It was very hard to G strain with no G suit. Like I couldn't get my, my muscles to tense up without something cueing them. It was so weird. Yeah, well, that makes sense because that's what we're always reminds you that you need the G-strain, right? You start feeling it inflating and you're like, oh, yeah, oh, yeah, I got to do something right now. Yeah, I'm. this is probably something that you're supposed to keep a secret. But the closest I've ever been to G-locking was in the backseat of the Blue Angels. At the, the pitch-up break that they do right before landing, they pull seven yeah. and a half in that pull-up and roll. And I was flying with number five, um, Mr. B. He's not on the team anymore. But I was holding a GoPro stick in this hand. And I had it up on the rail and I, I was G string cause I knew it was coming and I knew that was the spot that people would G lock. And so I was G straining as hard as I could, but I went full light loss. I was still aware of what was happening. So I wasn't fully out, but I could not see anything. It was black. And then as soon as he eased off the G, my vision comes right back. But if you've ever seen someone G lock, they like do the funky chicken where they flop around my arm, my one arm holding the GoPro, got really cold and tingly and like did the funky chicken by itself while I'm like watching it. It was the weirdest. <laughs> that I mean, is crazy. I was you can get to G-locking without actually doing it. It was the weirdest thing. <laughs> uh, what are the weird comms? Yeah. So everyone has their numbers. And I mean, I guess in a normal formation, two would respond with two. Um, but there's all these different, scenarios where the boss thunderbird one will say something and there's different responses so sometimes the response might be got it boss sometimes it'll be your number sometimes it'll be everyone so get two three four five six um and then there's always a word that each team picks it kind of helps keep morale up and it's a a gauge of how everyone's doing safe that word said, what what was that a safe word if you will no not, not a safe word <laughs> <laughs> this is going completely a different way. Um, <laughs> Sorry. So, like for a while, it was like, it was like, yeehaw. And then after that, the next year, it was like, all right. And so it would, it just lets the boss know that everyone heard the next maneuver. And so he'd be like, oh. we'll be back right for a Delta bup. And it would be like number three or four, whoever was assigned for it would be like, all right. And they could say it all different ways. So it was, it was, that was funny to listen to it evolve throughout the sortie. If it was like really turbulent or really windy or super high density altitude. And we were just on the struggle bus, a character building uh, demo is what we would call those. 
you can tell it in people's voices, especially in the <laughs> all right. Um, yeah. So there's just weird stuff like that. And it's just not something you do in the normal squad. And so it takes time to get used to what you say when. How long are your briefs and debriefs? Is that at least better than the fighter community? Yes, because we do the same thing all the time. So we always brief, always debrief. But once you get very proficient, the briefs can be as short as like 20 minutes. And the debriefs are pretty, we go through the entire show. Like we watch all the footage. People, before your maneuver, you say anything that you know was wrong with it. Then we watch it. So those generally take about an hour. They can be longer mm -hmm. if it's like not a good flight, but I would say an hour is pretty average. Yeah. Um, show us the gang signs and what they mean. Um, yes, I, you know I what know. this means? Oh, yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. So, the gang signs are I'm sure we could have a better name for them, but each pilot has their like little hand gestures that they do as they taxi out. Oh, and yeah. there's like one that's specific to your position. So, like when I was six, the six shooter was always one I would do. And when I was number five, it was that. Uh, but then you like usually just make up a few more. And it's kind of just a camaraderie thing between us and the maintainers because they're all lined up. And as we taxi pass, they learn every pilot's gang signs. And so the whole line of like 30 maintainers will do them all as each pilot goes past. And it's just a really cool, That's cool awesome. thing, thing between. So mine was for five was this. And then I wanted something just kind of unique and fun because some people in the crowd will do it too. So I did the oh, Ruby, cool. and then I flexed and then I, we, you know, the hair reg changed and we could wear a braid. And I added the hair flip. Um, and now threat who's number three on the team. She also does the hair flip and little girls in the crowd love the hair flip. I think it's a really cool. Yes. One. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Uh, are you still in touch with the girl that you met on the Kelly Clarkson show? Yeah, Amelia. She actually lives here in Vegas. So her um, her dad's a pilot. He flies out of the same airfield that I've been going to to do the GA stuff. Um, I've seen them. I see them like every few months. I actually flew with them out to Death Valley for like a women's fly-in. And I sat in the back of a Cessna. Actually, I think it was um, a Cherokee. I sat in the back next to Amelia and she was just so happy and then I actually, so she's one of three girls. She's the oldest. Her, the middle sister wants to be a blue angel. And then the youngest wants to be an astronaut. They're just a cool family. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah. And they've actually come to my house for a pool party last summer. So yes, I wow. definitely stay in touch. Wow. Well, so we got a whole bunch of uh, DCS questions. Have you ever, do you know what DCS is? Have you heard of this? I have on. only because I always get those questions in my DMs too, but I've never done anything with it and I don't know enough about it. So I just ignore them. I'm sorry for all of you that I haven't responded to. It's just not something I know much about or I'm into. So I, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, there was a question. I lost it, but I'll ask it anyway. Um, the, the time you got sick or not sick near motion sick in the back seat, uh, they would like that story. If there is one. Yeah, it's not too It just sucks flying injury. in the back seat. Yeah, yeah, just flying in the back seat. It's like riding in the back of a car. When you're not in control of the aircraft, you tend to, you're more prone to getting sick. And if you've seen the show, you know that the solo maneuvers are very aggressive, very fast roll rates, rolling upside down, rolling a bunch of times. And so when I'm training up my replacement, um, now number six, Thunder, he was in the front seat and I'm in the back seat and he's attempting these maneuvers for the first time ever. And so you're just not good at them at first. So everything is like too many G's too much push over bank, real aggressive. I'm bouncing my head off the canopy and it's hot. It's Vegas and it's bumpy and yeah, it's just not super fun in the back seat. Yeah. Um, so I guess this was a big part of your, your time, right? Because 2020 sucked for the entire world. Uh, yeah. what, what was, what was that like other than very dangerous because you're over these cities? I mean, was there a, a, a big, you know, public support for what you were doing? I mean, kind of, how'd you feel doing those? Yeah, it was a strange time because we're really, really good at what we do. 
but that took a lot of time and practice to get to be really good at. And so this was very different. So it was super rewarding to know we were having an impact on people. And some of the messages or videos you would see afterwards were incredible. Like you have kids who have been in lockdown for months and not seen their friends like in the backyard and we'd fly right over their house and they would just be like cheering. And I had a lady who said she took her veteran father who was in a, a home and wheeled him out and he got to see us fly over and then he passed away shortly after that. And just like how wow. meaningful it was for him. And there was just stories like that all the time. And it was super rewarding. It was also very difficult because we were kind of reinventing our mission and the logistical lift of getting tanker support, getting the airspace cleared. So there's a way less aviation traffic than normal. You would never be able to do that regularly. Like we flew over Atlanta and JFK yeah. and LaGuardia and Denver at 500 feet of smoke on like you would just, that would never happen. So that was cool to do all these unique things, but the FAA coordination that had to go into that, us calling when we were in the low level structure, we would map it out and it could, it was hundreds of miles of low level flying information. And we would look at the flight path and we would have to map out every tower so we knew we weren't going to hit anything we would map out every tiny little airfield we would look up their information and we would call them so i'm like calling <laughs> random 2000 foot long strip in colorado i mean like hey this is thunderbird five and the guy that answers the phone is like what um i'm like yeah we're gonna <laughs> fly over next saturday or next whatever at this time do you like can you make sure no one takes off like no one takes yeah. off VFR, not talking to anyone and is a conflict for our formation. And that was like, when I say we, I mean the pilots on the team, like we were doing all of that and like yeah. pulling notums for all those, like the amount of work that went into getting one city flyover was absolutely incredible. And by the end we got a lot better at the planning, but it was a big lift. And then the flying was difficult. So it was kind of, you know, Parts of it were really, really cool and parts of it were really tough and I don't really want to do it again, but I'm glad it had an impact. Were, were you deconflicting with radars? I mean, I guess you're busy flying formation, but I mean, are you trying to look for targets and stuff or pop up threats or? So like, number just four, one? yeah. Num so number one is so busy with just keeping us on the route. Um, number four, who's flying in the slot under number one, he's looking forward so he could cross check his radar some. Um, occasionally we would have a photo chase ship. So number seven or number eight, they're both F-16 pilots. They don't fly in the demo. One's the director of operations, one's the narrator and the advanced pilot. Sometimes they would fly chase. So they wouldn't be in the formation. Uh, they would be over here and they'd have a public affairs person with a camera in the back seat. but they would uh, also be able to scan for traffic. Um, we really, really relied on ATC. Like, we had some amazing controllers that really helped us out. Some that were obviously not used to fast jets and wouldn't tell us about traffic until it's like five miles away. And we're like, Oh, five miles. Like that's like now. Pop up threat. Yeah. <laughs> we, we need Work like left. a 40 mile and a 20 <laughs> mile point. Like five, it's too late. Like big yeah. sky theory at this point. Um, I guess the question, did you sh shut down before or after the snowbird, uh, fatal mishap that was that was part of that wasn't it that was part of the whole 2020 thing yeah it was their version of the covid flyovers when that happened that was that was tough for us because we all all knew jen really well um we she was their public affairs officer and we had all interacted with her several times in the previous season so that was fairly uh traumatic it's traumatic anytime a mishap that has a fatality happens it feels especially close to home when it's another demo team because yeah. you can put yourself in their position. And the fact that there was camera footage of it, like there was a video that we all saw was also very hard to watch. Um, I'm really yeah. glad that the pilot has recovered and he's back to flying, but it was still a super, super sad day. And we're good friends with a lot of them as well. So we definitely felt, felt that one. Well, I mean, the Thunderbirds had just lost Cajun, right? I mean, yep. it wasn't yep. too long ago that that, that happened. Yep. So very, very tough time. Um, 
on a happier note, uh, the changes made to the demo, I guess tighter formations and more noise seem to happen during your tenure. Can you, did you, yeah. were you a cause for this? <laughs> I mean, I can't take credit by myself, but uh, my team, the, the 2020, um, 2021 team definitely made that happen. And the reason that we were able to do that is because with the pandemic, we all got asked to stay a third year. And so normally during the winter is training season where three of the pilots in the demo are brand new. So you're taking every free second that you have to put into training them to get them good enough to start show season in March. Because we didn't have any new pilots, we had the time, I guess, to dig into some other things that had been on to-do lists for a long time that had never been gotten to. And one of those was, let's look at the demo, the amount of gas we have, people's attention spans at the end of the day, like how can we make this the most impactful? And number four's dad actually had worked for Disney and basically was like the head guy at Disney World for guest experience for like a really <laughs> long time. Yeah. So he was a huge resource to us because he dealt with all the live shows and everything there. And there's like a whole bunch of human psychology that goes into creating experience of performance with the music and the emotion and the themes. And none of that stuff was considered when the Thunderbird demo was built. That's just not how we think as fighter pilots. So getting his insight and really pairing up maneuvers that made sense and taking people through like graceful parts of the show. And then like in your face afterburner parts of the show made a little bit shorter with more AB and, we also were able to bring the formations tighter because everyone was very experienced. So the product that you saw at the end of the 2021 season, I mean, I hope other teams get there, but it was an exceptional team. And I had very little to do with that. It's really just the time we were given and the experience level. It's, it's rare that the team is, you know, almost everyone is a third year person or at least a second year person. Wow. Well, that's awesome. Well, Mace, I've appreciated all of your stories and your time. How can people find you um, or book you, right? So you're still yeah, doing your stuff. So what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Your website? Yep. So my website has um, like the contact me where you can fill stuff out. And that email literally comes directly to me. I see every single one. And then social media at Mace underscore Kern is Instagram. Um, I'm still on there some. I have started to put a lot more stuff on LinkedIn um, just for business reasons. So that's Michelle Mace Kern. Find me on there. I read all of the messages I get there as well. So there's, there's even an email um, on, you know, my, my Instagram, you can email at the top of my profile. So there are like five different ways people can get a hold of me. <laughs> yeah. Well, or they can just yell at you at the airport or baseball yeah. game. Yeah. If right? you see me just wave at me awkwardly and I'll, be very confused. So the last thing I'll ask parting shot before we leave little girl watching this little, small town wants to follow in your footstep. What's the best advice you can give her? Yeah, that you're capable and a lot more of a lot more than you realize, um, which I feel like is such as like stock statement, but it's really true. That kind of journey I went through to empower myself and like the, strength that you have once you get to that spot it's just incredible so if i can say anything to you know people early in their journey or kids that can make them realize that sooner without having to suffer through years of being like man i really suck at this um realize that you're not alone in your struggles and that there will be naysayers but there's really endless possibilities out there and you alone have the ability to make everything happen. Awesome. Awesome. Well, your story's great. I love what you're doing with your social media and, you know, just, just the message you bring, you know, you're, you're bringing humanity to this profession where everybody thinks you've got to be, you know, astronaut, you know, with, with, with no doubts and, and everything. So I appreciate everything you're doing and I look forward to seeing what's next. No, I appreciate it. This has been super fun. I hope everyone enjoyed it. Awesome. Thanks so much. You guys have a good one. Mm -hmm.